It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's the Jill on Money show. It is Memorial Day weekend and we are so grateful that you are joining us today want to thank everyone who's out there listening and especially want to thank those who have served this country because it is Memorial Day weekend more than anything else. We got to remember that. I also like to take a moment to remember uh, our nephew, my nephew who died in 2006 serving in Iraq, which is just amazing to consider how much time has passed. But Special connection to those who make the ultimate sacrifice. And again, thank you and thanks to everyone who has putting him or herself at risk. Thanks to those who are putting themselves at risk right now amid the coronavirus. People who are going to work every day, people who are packing up our groceries, people who are driving those groceries, people who are on the front lines of the medical care we're receiving. It's a real good moment to give some thanks for that. All right, we are broadcasting from the Capital One Virtual Studios. Capital One, what's in your wallet? And we are here to try to take you through some questions that you might have, some thoughts that are maybe muddling around in your brain, and also to answer your very specific questions. If you do have a question, why not send us an email? Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That is our email address. Okay. Here is a note. Let's get started from Adam, who uh, has been listening to our podcast. So, just for those, a lot of people who are writing in are podcast listeners, you're listening on the radio. But if you'd like to subscribe to our podcast, it is also called Jill on Money, and you can get it for free. Anywhere you get podcasts, if you don't know how to do that, you can go to Apple or Spotify or Stitcher or Radio.com or Google Play and just search Jill on Money and you will see that Mark and I have begun to do these daily podcasts. We've been doing this since the middle of March, so it's been a while now. And it's a similar format. We just make them very short, bite-sized question and answer. Sometimes we have guests as well. All right, let's get back to Adam's question. He writes, I'm getting a lot out of your podcast, especially as I just graduated from college and I'm working on figuring things out. I listen every day while I work from home. I'm 24. My wife is 23. I'm an engineer making $65,000 a year. She is a nursing assistant working with COVID-19 patients. Good grief. Hope she's safe. Okay. Other than a few hours lost, her job is secure as is mine. She makes $15 an hour. Our household income is around $96,000 per year pre-tax. Okay, here we go. My company offers a 401k match. Mark, this cannot be right. He wrote 150%. I'm thinking he means 1.5%. I'm not exactly sure what this is. His company offers a match up to 8%. He is contributing 8%, and he says it's an exceptional match. I've never heard of a 150% match. Yeah, Mark wants to know if they're hiring. Anyway, in the four months since starting work, we've been putting 5% of our income into an emergency fund, 5% in the Fidelity brokerage account, and we've allocated 60 stocks, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, mostly in sector and factor ETFs. Combined, we have $80,000 of student loans. We're making $700 a month on mine, even though they're deferred until August. We've got no credit card debt. We're making small car ma- payments to family. My wife is planning on going to physician's assistant school starting summer 2021. Do you have a- any suggestions as to what our financial priorities should be? Hmm, interesting. Starting in May, we're bumping the emergency fund to 10% to get the goal of six months expenses more quickly. I'm considering pulling the plug on the brokerage account, at least the contributions, and putting that towards student loans or the emergency funds. I hesitate to do this because I know the sooner one can put money into appreciating assets, the better. I'm not concerned about market volatility, rather taking on more debt from grad school on top of a high undergrad balance or and or half-baked emergency fund. We are lucky to be able to ask these questions. Any wisdom you can share would be much appreciated. Okay, here we go. 
Number one, no more brokerage account. Absolutely not. Put as much as you, so I like the 10% contribution into the six months expenses, but the money you are putting into the brokerage account, pop that right down on the student loans. Okay. Just do that right now. Might as well. Because as you said, I mean, you can put it in the, uh, for right now, you could, I guess, put it in the emergency fund as much, but then as soon as the interest clock starts ticking again on your federal student loans, then you're going to want to pay that down. In fact, I would consider this, my friend, whatever money's in that brokerage account, I would consider bailing out of it and selling it and taking the money because I'm wondering if perhaps you have gains not sure, but I the uh, you can tell me whether you do or not, and use that to actually put down on the student loans. And here's why: you made a funny um, note, which is you know, in, you said appreciating assets, but didn't we just learn that assets can go down in value? And wouldn't you rather pay down this debt before she starts going back to school? I say, get rid of the brokerage account. Continue to put money into, for sure, into your retirement account. But we got to be clear here, okay? It is really important for you to be smart about how this money is allocated in terms of your priorities. So I like the emergency reserve, number one. I think paying down the student loan debt, number two. And going forward, I think the goal could be or should be that you really focus on that debt and pay as much of it down as you possibly can. To me, that is the key. That's the real key. Okay. Good luck to you. And really, thanks for writing. Um, okay. Uh, I got, Mark didn't even send this to me, but I'll give it, the, I'll, I'll tell him. I got an email from a friend of mine who's been offered a package through work. And, uh, and he wants to know, what do you think about taking this package? I'm 61 years old and it would require that I spend all of the money that I've saved outside of my retirement plan, use it to supplement my wife's income. Okay. And until we can reach Medicare age, take the deal or don't take the deal. You know what? Don't take the deal. I don't like using up all of the liquidity that I have, unless they're going to pay you gobs and gobs and gobs of money, which, you know, I know the details, they're not. Remember, it's a long four years to get to that Medicare 65. And if you don't have tons of other money coming in, I say, keep working, be grateful that you had the offer. That's fine. Maybe if you were a little closer to 65, I would take it. But for now, keep on working and sock away as much money as you can, build up that non-retirement account so that you will be prepared the next time that offer rolls around. And I bet it will roll around. I just have a sense, have a good feeling about that. Okay. All right. We're going to go to a break. While we do that, why don't you go to the website, jillonmoney.com, and you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It is free, baby. Free, I say jillonmoney.com. We will be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And we are here to hold your hands through this financial and health pandemic. I should say health and financial pandemic. To put our hands underneath you, to prop you up, to boost you when you need a little bit of help. If you've got a financial question, if you have a question about benefits, if you have a question about your career, if you have a question about your portfolio or your taxes, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Okay. This is a note from 
Jeff, who says, thanks for the great show. I've listened for years. I love that you've gone daily. Ah, the podcast. My question may seem odd, but I feel like my wife and I have saved too much in the wrong place. Hmm. We are both 65. We retired about four years ago because she had muscular dystrophy and lung cancer. Oh my God, Jeff, I'm so sorry to hear that. Okay. Jeff continues. Over the years, I saved a lot in a company 401k, which is now in an IRA. Part of the problem is because of the medical issues, we don't have a chance to enjoy the money as we planned. Oh my God, that's so sad. We've got no children. The only caution is that home health care has to come out of our pockets. Okay. Our current monthly income without touching saving is sufficient. Here it is. He gets a pension of about 4200 bucks a month with 100% survivor benefit. My wife has a annuitized 403B, which is 1435 bucks a month with 100% survivor benefit for him. His wife's also receiving Social Security, $1,748 a month. We've easily lived off this income without touching any money in our Vanguard account or even the TIAA cash reserve. My intent was to wait until age 70 and uh, my Social Security at that time would be $3,800 a month. A lot of money coming in, right? Okay. With the above numbers, we aren't touching our current saving, which is a cash reserve of about 180,000. So here's what they have. Traditional IRAs, 1.4 million. Roth IRAs, 370,000. Brokerage account, 574,000. All this adds up to two and a half million bucks and the investments are mutual funds, approximately 55% stock, 45% bond. Sounds pretty good, right? Our only expense is a monthly mortgage and a condo fee. Um, and it's pretty cheap. It's essentially uh, about two grand uh, a month. Balance on the mortgage, 200,000. Value, 600,000. Okay, so let me just do a quick uh, back of the envelope. See, Mark, if you were a great producer, you'd ta- tally all this up for me so that I wouldn't have to do math on the fly, but I'm going to do it anyway. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm trying to figure out what he has in income to figure out his tax bracket. So let's figure that out. I'm doing it fast. Here I go. Oh boy. Uh-huh. 4255. 1435. So what we're going to try to do is figure this out so we know how much of the to of the conversion should occur. Okay, so here's what I got. Basically, about 90 grand a year in income. And that means married filing jointly, they are in the 22% tax bracket. Okay? Now, here's the deal. Over the next 5 years, what I think they should do is go right up to the limit of 171,000. It's a 171,050. And, um, and use the tax code to your advantage. 171,050 less the 90,000 of income means that you can convert about 80 grand a year that uh, is in the traditional IRA. It doesn't sound like a lot, but I think it would be great to have that tax paid. Now, if you want it to be more aggressive, you could even consider doing um, up to 325000 in conversion because the next tax bracket is 24%. You know, essentially what's um, interesting in your situation is that you already have fairly high income. So, you know, maybe before we start to get into that period of time when you are claiming your social security benefit, you might want to consider whether we should convert even more because you're going to have another 45 grand in income. So I think for now, the best thing to do is to convert um, as much money as you can um, up to that 22%. If you want to be more aggressive, go up to the 24%, pay the tax with some of that cash reserve. And you know, if you think you want to have a larger cash reserve, you could actually uh, sell some of the stuff that's in the brokerage account every year just to replenish your reserve. Okay. 
Now, the question is, the, the ne- so how much should convert to the Roths? I'm saying pretty much as much as possible. We're both on Medicare. We need to avoid those heavy Medicare surcharges, right? My wife currently receives a target therapy drug free for her cancer. It could cost eleven grand a year to receive it. Our income needs to stay below $100,000. Um, so he also says, I also worry if my wife passes away from the cancer, the RMDs will be huge because I'd be single, which is correct. Um, all right. I think you're just going to, I think you're going to just convert as much as you can. And even if you had to pay the 11 grand out of pocket for the cancer drug, I, I probably would just make that decision right now. I don't think that um, having this much money to actually withdraw on a required basis, um, I don't think that's going to be great for you. So I'm going to amend it and I'm going to say, rock on, convert as much as you can, pay the tax that's due, replenish the emergency reserve fund, of course, but um, don't, don't do so much that you would hurt yourself, that you would uh, make it difficult for you to have liquidity if you needed that liquidity. Okay. Here's a question from Janice, who's worried about where all the money the federal government is spending and sending checks out out to everyone is coming from. Is the U.S.'s money unlimited or are we printing money? Well, we're borrowing it, Janice. And we're borrowing it because people are willing to lend it and interest rates are really low. And this is what you do when the economy is cratering. You spend as much as you can. And if you heard Jerome Powell throughout this week, first on 60 Minutes on Sunday night and then before Congress, what he is warning is that if we don't spend this money now, the economy will shrink and actually stay smaller for a longer period of time. So the idea here is to crank it up, spend the money, borrow it where you can, while we can and while interest rates are low, and we will put our fiscal house in order when the economy has recovered. But for right now, the most important thing to do is to ensure that this recession does not persist longer than it need be. I think that's really important, okay? And so let's, as much as I think that people care about the debt and the deficit and all those things, and I think it's worthy of keeping that on the the back burner, it's on the back burner right now. It is not on the front burner, okay? And I've heard from a lot of you who are worried about this. Truly, when, when you have the Federal Reserve Chair, who's a pretty conservative guy, say that you don't need to worry about this issue this second, I think it's time to listen to that. Really. If you want to read more about this and about Powell, um, go to the website, jillonmoney.com. Click on the read vertical. Just there's a little link. It says read. And I wrote about this last weekend because I think Powell makes a very strong and smart case. So check it out. Go to jillonmoney.com. All right. When we come back from the break, we're going to answer more of your questions. It's Jill on Money. And feel free to shoot us a note. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is AskJill at JillOnMoney.com. And if you're on the website, which is coincidentally called Jill on Money, there's a button in the top right corner. Click on it. Mark will be there getting that email from you. JillOnMoney.com, always here for you. Okay, here we go. Hi, Aunt Jill and Mark. I've been a longtime listener since the 404 days. Oh, Tony, isn't that nice? I really appreciate your show and the great advice over the years. I believe I might have a question that I've not heard anyone else ask before on the show. 
Before I ask it, I just want to preface it by saying that I had this question in mind from before the pandemic and that generally I'm a fairly optimistic, level-headed, albeit pragmatic guy. All right, let's hear what is let's hear about Tony. I'm in my early 40s, single, no kids, no siblings. Parents are in their 70s. Assuming if I were to continue on in life being single and without a partner, without kids or relatives, friends that I could depend on, who can I entrust to manage my retirement savings if I were to go into a nursing home or suffer from dementia or Alzheimer's or lose my decision-making abilities? Who could be trustworthy enough to administer my retirement savings in a manner that's in my best interest, meaning that, of course, I want to get the best medical attention and treatments and medicines, et cetera. In short, what would you recommend is the best strategy to protect one's assets, savings, and retirements for the single elderly retiree? I'm hoping you don't say hire a lawyer. Thank you and Mark for your wisdom for achieving financial and mental well-being, especially during these difficult times. Um, Okay. He also said a little more background. He's been saving for retirement. He's got a year of salary in an emergency fund. He's got an HSA, a Roth IRA, a Roth 401k. He's got about $127,000 in liquid funds, $733,000 in retirement, 80% stock, 20% bonds, Um, I work in the government sector. I plan on working until I'm 67. I live in the D.C. area. I own a small house with a mortgage, uh, $290,000 outstanding, no other debts, pay off my card, my credit card bills, and I live within my means. I drive an economy car. Okay. Well, here's what I think. There's a couple of ideas that I, uh, yes, of course, I always say a lawyer, just number one, you got to have a lawyer because we got to make sure that your estate documents are in place. And so that to me is incredibly important. But as you go through the process of creating a will and a healthcare proxy and a power of attorney, I do think it's worth considering whether you have a friend who could take on this role in your life. Or if you have anyone in your life who you would really say, I trust this person. Maybe it's a younger colleague or friend or something like that. Now, without that, let's just pretend you don't have that. You don't have a distant cousin or anything like that. Then you are going to be um, faced with this idea of who should take care of this. And that would actually argue that you might need to have someone who you could trust and who would put your best interests first. And I'm afraid to say, my friend Tony, that that, in fact, could be a lawyer or it could be someone else that is serves in that um, capacity of, say, a CFP, a CPA. But there has to be someone in your life you could trust. And if, you know, you, you really got to start thinking about this because, as you said, You want to make sure that um, not just if you had dementia, but, you know, what would happen right now if you, something bad, you know, occurred, you broke your back or something, you need somebody who's in charge, who can run your, your financial life, but also help make healthcare decisions in your best interest. So I think it's worth it to talk to an attorney to make sure these documents in place are in place and perhaps more importantly, really start to give more thought, careful thought to how you want to proceed. Okay. Hi, Jill. This is from Kayla. What are the advantages and disadvantages for a 55-year-old of selling retire, uh, mutual funds in an IRA and transferring the money into a money market temporarily, then reinvest back into mutual funds once the pandemic is over in a year or two when we have a vaccine and herd immunity? Thank you, Kayla. Kayla, don't do this. I mean, I don't know what you're thinking. Everyone who writes these kinds of notes doesn't think that you're trying to time the market, but of course you are. So if you've got a well-diversified portfolio, there is no reason for you to try to figure out the top or the bottom of the market. Stick to your game plan. Come on. It's enough. Okay. Susan says, I heard the 10% penalty is being waived right now if you take money from a 401k retirement account. I'm wondering if that's true. It is true. It's being waived for this year, 2020, below the age of 59 and a half. And so it is waived for 2020. And on top of that, the CARES Act says that you have three years to pay the tax liability. Remember that your 
that when you take money out of a retirement account, that account has not been taxed yet. So you owe taxes both to the federal government and to your state if your state has a state income tax. So you will have three years to spread out that tax liability, and that's good news. Now, it's it's a tough decision, but if this is a break the glass scenario, I get it, and then do that. So no problem. You can do it, Susan. Um, and just be clear about how much you need and um, be sure to remember you've got to pay at least a third of it next April when you file your taxes. Okay. All right. You are listening to Jill on Money, and we are here to help take the mystery out of your finance, but really to support you during this financial fallout from the spreading coronavirus. And if you've got any sort of question, any sort of issue, don't hesitate. Just reach out to us. All you have to do is send an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That is our email address. And during the break, if you want to go on over to the website, jillonmoney.com, be sure to check out all the great stuff that we do. You can read the columns that I've written. You can listen to past shows and you can subscribe to the podcast, Jill on Money. Don't forget, we've got this great resource section. A lot of the information that you ask about the CARES Act or some of the small business administration loan programs, we've got all that stuff there. It's in our resource section of the Jill on Money website. So check it out during the break. And when we return, more of your questions. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we want to hear from you. It's uh, very easy to contact us. Just send us an email, askjill at JillOnMoney.com. That's what Laura did. And Laura writes, I recently discovered your podcast and I've been binge listening. Best thing ever. Too bad we don't have that on tape, Mark. Like when I say it, it just doesn't sound as good. Anyway, let's go back to Laura. She's 36 years old. She's single. She's got no kids or dependents. She currently lives abroad. And here's the deal. She's got pre-tax income of $170,000. Hmm, okay. She's got a hundred grand in CDs and high yield savings accounts, ninety thousand in a taxable brokerage account, and two hundred thousand in retirement accounts, a rollover IRA and a Roth IRA. I own a condo in the greater New York City area and I'm renting it out while living abroad. I'm not making any profit off my rental. It's more to keep it on hold while I am uh, living abroad, although I do not have a set time for when I will return to the US. My mortgage is $142,000. The rental income just about covers the mortgage. I currently do not make any contributions to retirement accounts. I do have $4,500 a month that I set aside for savings. My question, where should I put this money? My understanding is that I am over the income threshold to contribute to a Roth IRA. I would like to have a family at some point in the future. So what are my options to save. All right. Well, you're close here. Um, uh, in turn, well, you're not close. What am I saying? She's single. Yeah. You got, you're single. You're phased out at $139,000 for income on the Roth. And because you have, um, a rollover IRA, you can't do a backdoor Roth. So, I mean, maybe just keep saving in the taxable brokerage account and that's fine. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I don't know what you're doing in terms of that taxable brokerage account, but certainly what I would be looking at is trying to get a portfolio that is index funds. You might want to 
keep it a little bit simple and maybe even I like having that extra money in cash in case you want to have a family and that'll be expensive. But essentially, when I talk to everyone, when you're listening and I say, keep it cheap, what does that mean? It means you work with an organization that has the cheapest investments possible. That could mean places like uh, Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, TD Ameritrade, Fidelity, Charles Schwab. Why? Because they have index funds and index funds are super cheap. Fractions of a percentage every single year. That's it. And that's all I would do, Laura. I don't think you need a lot more than that, but I'm very clear for for someone in your situation, having some extra liquidity is a darn good thing to do. Okay. Matt writes, I love your podcast and your radio show, and I listen to it on YouTube. Hey, thanks to you and Mark for doing what you're doing. I read your Tribune column about estate planning regarding irrevocable trust. I'm not sure if I need one. Here's the story. So Matt is a renter. He lives in uh, LA. And he says, I've got beneficiaries named on all my accounts. I'm 51 single, no kids, no partner, no debt. You know, Mark, maybe we should start a, a dating service. We have a bunch of single people with a bunch of money. This could be a new, whole new part of the Jill on Money podcast and radio show. It could be a dating service. Anyway, let's get back to this. Matt says everything's paid for. He understands having a will, a power of attorney, a healthcare proxy. Do I need a trust? No. Why do you need a trust? You do not need a trust. Um, uh, the reason why people will have trusts is one, to have a, uh, a way to very clearly dispose of assets and maybe treat different family members in an unequal way. Um, for example, there may be someone who says, I've got three kids, one's a spendthrift, two are really responsible. And sometimes a trust can direct those assets more clearly. Um, but I don't think you need a trust, whether it's an irrevocable, which is not changeable, or revocable, which is changeable. So I don't think you don't you don't need it. It's not it's not a problem. Okay. So great that you should um, have all these things in place. Do have a will, do have a power of attorney, do have a healthcare proxy, but you don't need a trust, whether revocable or irrevocable. Okay. On a side note, when I talk financial stuff with one of my friends and mention your name, he always imitates your announcer. Should I invest my money here? Should I put my money there? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, right? Thank you again. Hey, thanks, Matt. And thanks to your friend who um, is making fun of Mark's liners that he wrote. Mark, maybe we got to write new liners. Did you ever think of that? Could be time. Ah, Mark says, I think they're catchy and isn't that a great example of it? True enough. It is hard to uh, do this sometimes and make it sound really fresh every single time. We try, we endeavor, but yes, we're happy to have that. And um, I'm happy to have anyone make fun of me. Someone just told me that I got rated highly for my TV appearance background. Uh, everybody, just to be 100% transparent, that ain't my house. That is a backdrop in a studio on Long Island. That's not my house. That's like a very farty, old looking house. There's no way I would have had that kind of house. Okay. All right. It's Jill on money. When we return, let's finish up this hour with uh, a question or two. The email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on money. And if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. It's very easy to get in touch with us. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That's ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Okay, let's see. Benedicta writes, I watched your recent interview on CBS News and then started listening to the podcast. I do love how you break it down on the podcast. Thanks for the great job you do. No, I mean, I had to say, this is awesome, Mark. It makes me feel so good about what we're doing. I really do. Okay. 
Benedicta says, I'm a first time home buyer and I've been looking for a home since late 2019. Considering the state of the economy, impact of the pandemic, and heightened uncertainty levels, do you think I should stick to my objective of buying a home this year? Do you think I should renew my lease, which expires in July, and defer this till another time? I live in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. Well, okay, here's the question I have. A couple of things. Number one, are you gainfully employed? Do you feel comfortable that your position is going to be preserved? Do you feel like you can financially afford to make this purchase? I mean, if everything is still holding as it was back in late 2019, then I would keep doing it. I would look for a home. And um, and if you can't buy by the time your lease expires, maybe you could see, could you go month to month? That's a possibility. But I think that as long as you've run the numbers and you feel secure in your job, I do believe that this is a good time to buy a home. I mean, gosh, interest rates are really low. Mortgage rates look very uh, solid. So I'd keep on keeping on. Lorraine writes, are retired Americans supposed to receive stimulus checks? Yes, as long as their income is underneath that threshold. Haven't received one. I've been filing electronically for almost 10 years. So maybe you make too much money, but if not, you should be getting a check. All right, that's it for the hour. When we return, we've got two separate interviews for you. I think you kind of like them, kind of dig it. Uh, Remember, we are broadcasting from the Capital One Virtual Studios, and we'll be right back. the weekend and that can only mean one thing you're listening to jill on money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances here's your host jill schlesinger you're back it's our number two of the jill on money show and we are broadcasting from the policy genius virtual studios policy genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance All you have to do is go to policygenius.com and you see they've got all different kinds of insurance there. So boy, if you didn't learn about having to have some protection during this pandemic, I don't know. You're missing the boat. Anyway, uh, okay. For this hour, we've got two different interviews. We're going to start with my interview with Kathy Craninger. She is the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And uh, we are very, we are very fortunate to have her. And I, I really do appreciate her coming aboard with us because I think that she's got some very good information about some weird stuff going on with scams associated with coronavirus. Here is our interview with CFPB Director Kathy Craninger. We've been getting emails from folks who say that there are scams about they're worried about their older relatives, but also it seems like a lot of small businesses are really having a trouble getting through to the banks to access the SBA programs. They too are seeing scams. I know it's so depressing to start with this, but can we just talk a little bit about why we all need to be a, a little bit more on alert right now? Uh, absolutely. And and you are incredibly uh, accurate in that. Uh, any situation that we see in the marketplace, of course, scammers take full advantage of that. And so uh, I see the coronavirus uh, as another hook where scammers are trying to you know, get personal information from consumers, particularly vulnerable consumers who feel isolated right now. Uh, and that is, is certainly affecting uh, older Americans, as you mentioned, in particular. Our ability to make sure that they have uh, the right information that they know, you know, an, an email from the White House or the Centers for Disease Control or the World Health Organization that says, hit this link and see the steps to take. 
Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's the kind of thing that scam artists are doing. You know, you hit the link and you're in the midst now of, of downloading malware or um, otherwise getting phone calls that say, you know, give me your information so you can get your check from the IRS. The government is never going to ask you for that personal information uh, by contacting you by phone or email. Uh, so everyone really needs to hear that message. Yeah, indeed. Um, let's talk a little bit about the people who are really directly impacted by the virus in terms of their financial lives. Now, the way that I got in touch with you is that I went on CBS this morning and I talked about this tool that I thought you guys had put up, which is fantastic, which is essentially a way to figure out what are the most important bills that you need to pay. I'm wondering if you are someone impacted by the scam or a small business owner, can you talk about some of the relief options that you see? For example, let's say I'm, I think we got a lot of people who are small business owners who say, you know, I don't want to go refinance my house, pour the money into my small business. What are some of the options for people who have big mortgages out there and they just can't pay it right now? Yeah, thank you for highlighting that because, you know, truly there are people who are who are affected either by a loss of income uh, or a loss of a job. Uh, if they're not affected by, by the healthcare um, dynamics itself and, and actually being ill with the pandemic, the economic impacts are, are significant. Congress uh, and the government uh, have provided new programs, new relief uh, that we've got great information on our website about at consumerfinance.gov, as you pointed out, and I know you'll provide the links to your listeners here. All you have to do is uh, contact your mortgage servicer if you're talking about mortgage relief and make sure that you've got the right information about you know, who your servicer is, who backs your loan. All the mortgage servicers are providing relief uh, when consumers say, hey, I'm, I've been affected by this, had a loss of income that I did not expect and, and that is due to coronavirus, and they'll work with you. Uh, if you have a federally backed mortgage, uh, you are entitled under law uh, of up to 180 days of forbearance, which means just a, a hold on payment uh, and they'll work with you. Uh, look, the one thing that is important for people to understand is if they have some ability to pay, it will be beneficial to them to pay. Um, interest will still accrue. And, and so that's why you need to talk to your servicer and work out details. And I guess the last thing, uh, Jill, I would mention is if you have any problems reaching your servicer or, or getting the right outcome for you, contact the CFPB. We've got a complaint system. Uh, we will step in and assist you in getting uh, relief from your service providers and make sure they're following the law. Um, so many of them are trying to, but they're also affected by this crisis. And so we are, we are here uh, to support consumers during this time. Now, if you don't have a mortgage that's backed by the federal government, not a Fannie, a Freddie, or a HUD, I saw a note from the FDIC that sort of said, hey, listen, everyone else out there, we want you to work with your borrowers. Is that happening? Yes, uh, it is definitely happening. Uh, we hear it from consumer advocate groups. Uh, we hear it from the uh, banks and other financial uh, institutions that are supporting consumers. But it's also a challenging time. As I noted, they, their operations are impacted. People do make mistakes. Uh, so the relief is there. Uh, there are a lot of different things that they can work out with you, even under you know, current law and current rules uh, before the CARES Act was passed. Uh, there are options in the loss mitigation space for people to come forward and work with their creditors and lenders. Uh, so that's what's happening now. Uh, it does have to be catered to each individual's circumstances. Uh, in many cases, you absolutely should get some relief. What happens if, you know, you go out, you ask for relief, whether it's a mortgage, it's your landlord, a credit card, because credit card companies I know are also offering some relief from fees and penalties. Is that going to negatively impact someone's credit? Because a lot of people are saying, you know, I don't want to have to go back out and, you know, sort of climb out of the hole again. I was at 650. I finally got to 800 and now I'm going to scared I'm going back. What's the impact on your credit score and the credit reporting part of this? So I can tell you, Jill, that's one lesson that we absolutely uh, learned if we didn't know it before the financial crisis. And so we are way ahead of this problem in terms of credit reporting and making sure that the credit reporting system maintains its accuracy. 
um, but making sure that furnishers, which is those creditors or lenders, that they're sending the right codes and right information to credit reporting agencies about how to characterize the accommodation that they made with the consumer. We are working through that, absolutely. Um, it is the case that, frankly, post any disaster, there are uh, accommodations that can be made and that they are taken into account in the credit report and therefore don't have an impact on, on an individual's credit. I will tell you the CFPB is working uh, very hard to make sure we, again, maintain that accuracy and that you know, there's a balance here with respect to what, what impact should happen or should not happen. Um, and we're, we're really thinking hard and working hard on, on that aspect because we take the point. We don't want people detrimentally affected uh, with a what hopefully is a, a very short-term impact for many. We'll get back to our interview with CFPB Director Kathy Craninger in just a second. While we're on the break, why don't you go onto the website to jillonmoney.com. You can bookmark it. And then, of course, you can get to it anytime. And then you've got the contact button. Everything's right there for you. Do that. Do that right now. Okay, we'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And this hour, we've got a couple of different interviews for you. We are in the middle of our interview with Kathy Craninger. She is the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And she was so nice to spend some time with us. Uh, after the crisis erupted. And I really think the CFPB has some pretty awesome tools on the website. We just talked about the scams. And if you missed that segment, make sure that you go back and listen to that later this weekend if you get a shot. Uh, But in this segment, I was interested in learning what she believed to be the, the differences and the similarities between this crisis and the financial crisis. So here's the rest of our interview with CFPB Director Kathy Craninger. Kathy, when you kind of look back, you know, 12 years ago, you were sort of in the soup at that time during the financial crisis. What lessons did we learn from 2008 and 2009 that helped us in our response to this COVID crisis? I will say the circumstances of this crisis, obviously, with the underlying strength of the economy are very different. Capital and liquidity requirements that are significantly different uh, across the industry. Uh, But there are different players and a different mix of players in the financial services space that are giving consumers choice, but also have different underlying requirements. I'll just say, you know, bank and non-bank players in financial services and and what roles they play and what services they provide. It is a different dynamic. Um, The CFPB is here, at least with respect to consumer protection requirements, regulating both. Uh, And so that's something that we are maintaining, uh, making sure that we have clear requirements for those players in the space, you know, we're on the watch there. I, I guess in terms of other other uh, lessons learned, we are here now paying very close attention to those interactions with consumers, providing clear information about the kinds of questions consumers can ask and should ask. And the institutions know that. There are many responsible institutions that, that were out way ahead of even government action in, in terms of Uh, responding to consumers who needed accommodation. But we are backing that up and we are watching. I'm wondering when we take a good hard look at where we are in this crisis and, you know, you say we hope that things get better, but obviously we have no idea where this is going. What's the message that you want consumers to understand about how to navigate their own financial process right now? Uh, it's something I'm, I've actually heard quite frequently. Um, it's, you know, plan for the worst um, and hope for the best. And it really is thinking through uh, your own situation, um, your spending habits, uh, which I, uh, for all of us are significantly curtailed uh, and, and certainly redirected to different activities than uh, on the discretionary side than things we otherwise would be paying for. Uh, but really thinking about that 
where you are in terms of your income right now and, and how that might change. And recognize, too, that the government agencies and, and government as a whole are really assessing this day by day. Uh, as we watch what's happening and how the industry and, and the markets and the economy are responding, we are looking to provide relief. And so I think that payment protection program is a, a huge, uh, massive undertaking to maintain employment and, and to help people, again, maintain income. We've got the increased unemployment payments that are going out, again, to try to increase uh, and, and maintain income for for individuals. So there is help, there is assistance, reprieves on, on bills uh, where you need that help. Uh, that's also incredibly uh, important opportunity for people if they're, if they're struggling. We know that there, for some, are gonna be some long time, long-term implications, uh, regardless of how long this goes. Uh, so it's something that we're regularly assessing and, and looking to address appropriately. How concerned are you that we're just going to lose a chunk of the nation's small businesses? Look, small businesses are a huge part of our economy. They're a huge part of the employment base. And keeping those small businesses going, or I guess I could say ready for stepped up recovery uh, over time is, is a hugely important thing. And we all recognize that. And we're working to make sure that small businesses have uh, the information that they need, the, the uh, capabilities they need to make sure that they can come back. And I will say that the comeback will be different. Secretary Mnuchin said that it's not a guarantee that every organization will come back the same way, but, but it is important to maintain that base. That's where our entrepreneurs are. That's where our innovation is. That is the, the lifeblood of our economy. And so it's a, it's a huge part. And, and we are here to support those small businesses. It's just, it's so heartbreaking. You know, I hear from these folks and they just, you know, this frustration. And then I call the banks and the banks blame the government. And then the government says, no, it's the banks. And so it's a lot of finger pointing here. Is there any any idea about what the bottleneck was? Was it just sheer volume and the program just began very quickly? What, what, what do you think the bottleneck was? It really is a massive undertaking. I mean, it, $350 billion is the biggest program SBA has ever run by far. And it was stood up and, and taking applications and actually pushing money out the door, uh, I believe, within 10 days. I mean, that is, that is uh, frankly, a tremendous, uh, a massive success, as I think uh, history will look back on it. So look, that's going to be huge. You've got over 4,000 lenders, uh, many of whom have never worked with SBA and SBA programs. Uh, so yes, there are, there are absolutely hiccups in that. There are challenges in that that are uh, natural but overcomable. And and frankly, I think there's there's really a, a Herculean effort that's been happening there at SBA and and frankly at all the lending institutions. I recognize that every day and every hour matters, the uncertainty and, and questions that people have. Uh, but please know that uh, there are people working hard to answer those questions, uh, to triage that, to be as transparent and responsive as possible. Uh, SBA put out the numbers in terms of you know, where the loans have gone and the administration seeking more funding from Congress for this program. It, it truly is essential. And I think, you know, there, there are still things to, to work out for sure, um, but a lot of progress is made and people are being helped. Yeah. I, I mean, I look, I certainly think that we absolutely have to really be pushing these institutions. And unfortunately, it's almost like every process in dealing with lending, it's onerous. But I, I want to remind small business owners, I was a small business owner 100 years ago. And you know what? It stinks that you're going through this, but please don't be dissuaded because there are programs that can help you. And I think that to me is huge. All right. Before I let you get back to saving the world, what else do I need to know? What do our listeners listeners need to know about going through this period and what are you binge watching? <laughs> uh, I'm not having a whole lot of time for binge watching, but but I definitely have my Netflix account, uh, at least on the background, sometimes as a good distraction. I will say what else people need to know is, is there are still people and there are aspects of the economy that were readily adaptable to more telework. Uh, certainly the government uh, employees are continuing to work. 
And so it's important for those of us who have maintained income to pay our bills, to um, you know, continue to uh, engage and, and think about our finances and take the right steps. There are things that are going to come back in the economy. Clearly, you know, people are watching investments and, and, and concerned about that, but it's an impact that everyone's feeling. And giving the healthcare situation a chance to, to you know, the public health system to work through some very significant challenges there and, and get us to the other side. I think the economic uh, recovery will, will happen when we can get some more assurance on the public health side. So I think there's, there's a, a, a great opportunity for uh, all of us to, to have that patience that you were just talking about, but thinking about our own finances, taking the time if we have the time or, or looking at our, our uh, debt picture, as you pointed out too, we've got great tools at consumerfinance.gov if you have the time and the wherewithal to, to be assessing your finances, now is a good time to do it. Thanks so much to CFPB Director Kathy Craninger. And when we come back, we're going to give you another interview. How about that? Two, two different interviews for the price of one. All right, the price is free. But anyway, two interviews. It's Jill on Money. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back. It's Jill on Money, the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. A lot of you have written in because you are small business owners uh, or you work for a small business owner. And, And obviously, the small businesses out there have been really hit hard by the virus. So many of you are really struggling and and we understand that. So we thought we'd spend some time with an organization and a person who's got experience dealing with small businesses. So I kind of leverage some of my connections. Let's be honest. You know how I wrangle things. Yeah, I just, I, I convinced my friends to make their friends available to me. That's what I did with American Express. We've got the chief marketing officer of American Express. Her name is Elizabeth Rutledge. And I was really interested because American Express began, remember that years ago after the financial crisis, they did Small Business Saturday. Well, now for the pandemic, they've created Stand for small.com. That is a website that is helpful. It's like a resource center for small businesses. So standforsmall.com is what they've launched. A lot of different companies that are participating in that. So I encourage you to check out this interview with Elizabeth Rutledge and check out that website. So here we go. Here's our interview with Elizabeth Rutledge. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, American Express and the efforts that the company is making to help your small businesses out there, that not just yours, but all small businesses that are out there? You know, the first point I would make is just how important small businesses are to the economy. And I know you know this. The numbers really speak for themselves. You know, 30 million small businesses, they account for 60 million small business employees, and they're contributing like 44% of the U.S. GDP. And I think we've all experienced this ourselves in terms of the small businesses in our own communities, in terms of the enormous challenges that they're facing uh, given the pandemic, whether it's you know around their costs just really outpacing any money that they're bringing in. A lot of them have the inability to operate, you know, kind of physical businesses, and, and a bunch of them don't have any online alternatives. Some of them are managing a virtual workforce for the, the first time, and I think just a lot of them are very uncertain how to plan for recovery. So mm-hmm. American Express, along with uh, many other partners, uh, launched Sam for Small. I'll just take a few seconds to tell you what it's about, Jill. It's a digital hub. A uh, single location for small businesses to go to. Uh, lots of vital information in the hub um, includes resources and insights and education and offers to help small businesses manage through the crisis right now. And there are about 60 plus leading brands that are contributing 
And as you mentioned in your question, all small businesses are eligible for these assets. You know, you don't have to be an Amex uh, card member to take advantage of what's in the hub. And in the hub, when you go there and you say, let's let's go, and yeah, here I am clicking on it, um, what is it that you want to make clear to people? Because I think there are some who are going to say like, okay, wait a second, does this mean that uh, American Express is going to try to sell me something? What's the experience of like, what's going to happen for these businesses? How can you help them in this process? Yeah, I think, Jill, the best way to answer that question is to give you kind of, you know, a real live example. Imagine if you were a restaurant owner and you had to close your physical doors but you're still operating a a takeout business, here's what you would experience if you went on the hub. You'd see uh, an offer from uh, Resi, um, which would allow you a free listing option. So you can create a restaurant profile, and then you can share ways that your customers can support you. You can get discounts from Avis and Budget, and you might be sort of watching your head saying, why would I need, as a restaurant owner, discounts from Avis and budget? But imagine if you're now supporting delivery of takeout food and you never did that before, these discounts on weekly car rentals would be, I think, invaluable to you. And then lastly, I'll give you an example of a webinar that um, is hosted every week through Stand for Small. It's through Dentsu, and some people may not uh, know that uh, name. It's a uh, global ad agency. And they're live streaming a weekly uh, sort of seminar and experts um, in database marketing, in search optimization, um, in digital commerce. Um, And we just hosted our first one last week for Stand for Small. We had, uh, I think, almost 25 businesses uh, joining all these experts um, there live, you know, obviously virtually, giving them advice. Um, and also what was really cool was uh, the small business owners were sharing with one another, too, in mm-hmm. terms of what they were doing. I think what's kind of cool is that sharing part, that community. Um, I, w- I was just talking to um, a small business owner today. He owns a little coffee shop. And he's like, Jill, Jill, guess what? He's like, I got the PPP. I got the loan. And I said, what happened? Well, he had gone through the kind of the normal channel of a large bank and just was kind of put in the queue to nowhere. And he joined a Facebook group of like coffee shop owners. And this is, you know, obviously a smaller group than you guys are are hosting here. But on that group, someone said, hey, you know what's so wild? This bank from Idaho was able to process my loan and I got money in 48 hours. And it worked. So this is also just, as you said, it's getting great advice, but it's also sharing best practices and sharing resources. Because I feel like when you're a small business owner, it's pretty lonely when the crap hits the fan, isn't it? It absolutely is. And oftentimes you don't know where to go. Uh, Either you don't have the time, the resources, the knowledge. So those connections are just so important. And, you know, speaking of connections in a different sort of way, that's how this Stand for Small got stood up, you know, pun intended. Um, it was all about leveraging, you know, our longstanding relationships and partnerships with brands. And we were able to pull this off in 14 days. And I just think it's about those same kinds of conversations, different kinds than what you're referencing, but that's how this got put together through those uh, connections. We'll get back to our interview with Amex's Elizabeth Rutledge in just a second. If during the break you need some help, you're a small business owner and you want to go to standforsmall.com, you can also go to the Jill on Money website, jillonmoney.com, and check out the resource section. We've got a lot of the Q&As associated with some of the SBA programs for small businesses. So just go to jillonmoney.com and click on the resource tab. Okay, we'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. 
You're back. It's Jill on Money. This is the program that is trying to hold your hand through the virus, but also just been here a long time. Mark and I have been doing this show for what seems like 100 years. I think it's 11 years, 10 years now, nine years. I don't remember, Mark, but it's something like that. And if you've got a financial question, if you've got a, a big issue that you're facing, a choice perhaps, why don't you give us a shout? The email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Askjill at jillonmoney.com. And uh, by the way, if you have a chance, because, you know, a lot of people are working from home and there's a little extra time, maybe you might consider doing this. Why don't you just go ahead and learn how to download a podcast? It's so easy. You can go to any of these big providers, right? Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play. Just make this a priority. Just go to one of these places and search for Jill on Money. There you will see our podcast will pop up. It's a daily podcast. And then you subscribe to it and you can listen whenever you'd like. Isn't that easy? So easy. And yet so many of my mother's friends tell me, I don't know how to do a podcast. You don't have to actually do a podcast. All you have to do is listen to it, and it's really easy to do. So if you have a mobile device, you can actually access this. It's super easy. Okay. Now, let us get back to our interview. We are talking to Elizabeth Rutledge. She is the Chief Marketing Officer for American Express. And American Express has been pretty much at the forefront of helping small businesses navigate tough times. Remember, after the financial crisis, they created Small Business Saturday. Now they have created StandForSmall.com. It's, it's kind of a hub of interesting stuff and resources for small businesses. So in this section of our interview with Elizabeth Rutledge, we're going to talk about some of the tools that American Express has available at StandForSmall.com. Here we go. The rest of our interview with Elizabeth Rutledge. It's kind of interesting when you think about these small businesses, right? 30 million small businesses and they employ 60 million people. Now, obviously, some of these businesses are not going to survive and that sucks, right? I get that. Is there some way that we can help people kind of not just get through, but also say, wait a minute, you know what? Maybe, maybe I can't reopen. What's the resource there for those kinds of people, do you think? The really cool thing um, about the site is there's also uh, resources and insights and articles from other providers um, on the site that will just, I think, give you knowledge. I think knowledge is power. And I think that's what you're talking about, Jill. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is power. And um, hearing from others what they need to think about to forecast the future, how to take in all the data around them in terms of what would make the most sense for them in terms of keeping their business open. If you check it out, there's uh, so much content there, um, mm -hmm. I think, to, to help these small businesses make some of these tough decisions that you're talking about. Now, let's talk about you a little bit, Chief Marketing Officer Fancy Pants. What was your first job at American Express? Let me start with that. My first job, I was actually um, on the consumer business managing uh, one of our benefits for the green card uh, back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. And I've had just so many great opportunities um, across the company, uh, both in our merchant organization, um, supporting our uh, network of merchants. I've been in new product development. I've been in marketing, in acquisition, loyalty. I've seen it, I've seen it all. Um, and it's just been um, an incredible experience for me in terms of having sometimes global jobs, sometimes local jobs and serving many different customers, whether it be consumers or on the B2B side as well, or merchants. It's just been a fabulous ride. So what is it they put in the water at American Express that everybody loves it there? I mean, I do feel like it's a little bit of a, there's some secret sauce, and um, I don't encounter that so often. I, I interview a lot of executives in different companies, but there is a feeling, you know, although this is, there's, I don't know, a couple, what, it's, it's 160 years old or something, whatever it is, 200 years old, a zillion people. What is it about that company? That's, what's going on there? I'm intrigued. Our focus on supporting our colleagues. And that's been the priority, uh, you know, during this very challenging time for all of us. And the colleagues are at the core and the way we've been operating, particularly over, you know, the last two months or so 
is just to make sure that we're taking care of our colleagues, that their safety and well-being is front and center. And when you take care of your colleagues, um, then you take care of your customers. And I think mm-hmm. that that's been the philosophy all along. It's also just a great place to learn and grow and develop. You get so many different experiences, as you heard me describe as well. Um, but it, it isn't just the power of the colleague at the center of, um, you know, of the company. That's the culture. It's about relationships and connections. From the team that brought you Small Business Saturday and now Stand for Small, you are innovators. And it's very, it, it's impressive. It really is. Because as you said, to turn this around in 14 days, I feel like you should have administered the whole PPP program. It probably would have done, been done a little bit more efficiently. <laughs> well, you know, Jill, we're all, we're definitely all, we're all in this together. You know, as you said, the power of community, uh, that's what's going to make a difference. Uh, we need to be about action. We need to be about action now. Um, and that's why I'm proud for, for Stand for Small um, and what we're all doing, not just American Express, but all these partners uh, together uh, to help uh, the small business community. Thanks so much to Elizabeth Rutledge of American Express. The website, standforsmall.com. If you can't remember that, don't worry. We're going to put it on our resource section. When we return, we'll finish up the program with one of your questions. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Before we finish the show, just want to remind you that we are broadcasting from the Policy Genius Virtual Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Just go to policygenius.com. I like this note. It's very interesting. This is from Andrew who is thanking us for the daily pods, which serve to keep many of us sane in this insane time. So Andrew in Atlanta says, my wife and I are newlyweds, and we are curious if you have any book recommendations for couples trying to manage household financials together. We are established adults. We have our savings, retirement, and other other goals underway. But we're looking for some advice on the mechanics of managing cash flow with the goal of understanding how we can spend less time splitting bills and manually documenting spending. I know every couple does it differently. We're open to new ideas. We just need some sound resources that can save us from the trial and error. Thanks again, Andrew. Well, Andrew, I don't know if you need a book, but I mean, if you do, you can buy my book, which is The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. But the reality is, if you're trying to, maybe you're, I'm thinking that maybe you're newlyweds because you're established, you want to keep your money separate. All I would say is that as much as you can automate some of these, um, some of your spending, the better off you'll be. And when you look at your overall game plan, if you just want to keep maintaining a separate life, that's fine. All you have to do is have one house account Both of you can automatically dump money in there, and then the bills will get paid automatically from that account. That's all. Let's not overthink it. If I'm missing something, feel free to follow up with me, and I I, want to get you both on the phone and make sure I understand what's going on. So maybe Mark will arrange for a call if you need more help. But don't overthink this too much. It really isn't that hard. All right. Automate, automate, automate as much as possible. Okay. That's it. That's the show. Thanks so much for listening. Again, if you need some help during the financial fallout from this pandemic, please send us an email. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com. Do something nice for each other. Keep those hands clean. Wear those masks. Keep social distancing. And we will talk to you next week.